Good evening. How's everybody doing tonight? It's good to be here at the Christian Endeavor Convention. I appreciate the opportunity I was given to speak this evening. Um, I was given the interesting task to speak on the birth of Moses. So we'll see how this goes. Think about this. You were born at exactly the right time. If you had been born two months earlier or two months later, you wouldn't be you. You'd be somebody else. You were born at exactly the right time to be who you are. When you talk to most kids, you'll discover that they're dissatisfied with their birthdays. Because you talk to them and they're always wanting to be a different age, right? You ask a seven-year-old girl how old she is, she's probably going to tell you, I'm going to be eight. Now, you ask a 39-year-old lady that. Wait, no. You You don't do that. Somewhere along the line, things change. So maybe there's been a time in your life where you wish that you were born at a different time. But if you were born at any other time, you would not be who you are. You were born according to God's timing at just the right time. And you can thank God for that tonight. God made you. God placed you here, and you were born just at the right time. So, what does that have to do with anything? We come to the birth of Moses, a man who God used in a mighty way. Some may say that there's no greater man in all of the Old Testament. God used him to take his people, Israel, out of Egypt. He used them to lead them through the wilderness. He used them to give his laws and his commandments. And you guys are going to learn all about this this week, so I'm not going to get into too much of that. God even, he prepared Israel to enter the promised land through Moses. Moses was born at a difficult time. He was born at a dangerous time. But we look at his life story and we discover that he was born exactly at the right time. Tonight we're going to look in Exodus chapter 2 where we find the story of Moses' birth. Now, this is a familiar passage of Scripture, but I want us to look at it tonight with new eyes. I want us to hear it with new ears, because I believe that God wants to speak to us through this passage tonight. So, turn with me, if you have your Bibles, or you can just look up on the screen, and we're going to be in Exodus chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 1 through 10. Now, a man from the house of Levi went and took as his wife a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son. And when when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. When she could no longer hide him, she took him in a basket made of brussels and dabbed it with bitum and a pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds by the river bank. And his sister stood at a distance, to know what would be done with him. Now the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river, while her young woman walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her servant women, and she took it. When she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby was crying. She took pity on him and said, This is one of the Hebrew children. And then his sister said to Pharaoh, his daughter, Shall I go and call you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. So the girl went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take the child away and nurse him for me. I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. When she grew older, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses. Because she said, I drew him out of the water. (coughs) Excuse me. We look at the story of Moses and the story of his birth and the way he was adopted into Pharaoh's household and the way God provided for him. And the whole thing really is 
a familiar story to us. But tonight, as we look at it, I want you to think not about the human side of the story. When I was looking for ideas for this sermon, I saw a lot of Mother's Day type sermons, and I really didn't think that that would kind of fit into the youth kind of thing we were trying to go with tonight. So I decided to go a different way. Tonight, we're going to look at the divine side of this story. I want you to think not about Pharaoh's daughter, what she did, or what Moses' mother did, or what his sister Miriam did. Although we're going to talk about those things, I want you to look beyond what people were doing and see what God was doing. And I want you to think about how you can apply the truths in this passage to your own life. I want you to see several principles in this passage. First of all, the Bible shows us in this passage that God made you for a reason. <coughs> There's something, I, this is something I believe God wants us to know tonight. You were born at the right time, and God made you for a reason. You were no accident. You weren't a fluke. He made you for a reason, and he made you for a purpose. Now we look at Moses' birth, and it, we may be tempted to say, well, what a terrible time to be born. I mean, think about the circumstances of his birth. If you look back, back at chapter 1, we get a little more context, and you can see what's going on at the time Moses was born. So if you look with me at Exodus chapter 1, we're going to look at verse 8. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. You remember the story in the book of Genesis. All of God's people were taken, taken into Egypt. They were led there because they found refuge there. And Joseph took care of his brothers and all of his family. And he really loved them. Joseph was a hero to all the Egyptians, and so were his brothers. Everybody was so thankful for them. But then a new king arose in Egypt who did not know Joseph. He did not know Joseph and how he had rescued the whole nation from famine. And the Bible says this king, if you look with me in verses 9 through 11, he said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. If war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh store cities, Pitom and Ramses. Now the Bible tells us because the people of Israel were multiplying so greatly, and because Pharaoh and the other Egyptians became intimidated, they started doing everything they could to oppress God's people and to push them down. He even instructed the midwives, listen, when a Hebrew boy is born, you kill them. Don't let them live. But these midwives honored the Lord God and allowed the children to live. And so Pharaoh took even more drastic measures and he gave an order. You know what that order was? That all male children of Israelites were to be thrown into the river and there they would die. If the crocodiles did not eat them, they would drown. If you look with me in verse 22, you'll see that. Then Pharaoh commanded all of his people, Every son that is born to a Hebrew, you shall cast them into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. It's a little hot in here tonight. Think about the circumstances. For an Israel baby to be born in these days... It was a dangerous time. It was a life of slavery, misery, where if you were a little boy, your life was going to be snuffed out in his infancy. And yet, in the midst of all this, a man of the tribe of Levi took with his wife from the tribe of Levi. His name was Amran, and her name was Jochebed, and they were Moses' parents. And they had a baby. Verse 2 says, the woman conceived and bore a son. Now, in the book of Exodus, the word of God emphasizes the faith of Jochebed. 
the faith of his mother. But if you look in your Bibles in Hebrews 11.23, there you'll see the word of God emphasizes both the father and the mother's faith. It commends both the father and the mother for trusting God. Now think about this. It was an act of faith for this couple to have normal marital relations during this dangerous time when the Jewish babies were being killed. They had already had two children. They had a daughter, Miriam, and they had a son, Aaron, who was three years older than Moses. And yet, they were obedient to God, and they had another child. Moses became a man of great faith, and he learned that faith first from his godly parents. And he was born for a reason. The Bible talks about that, and it is so clear that God saw us in our mother's wounds even before we were born. If you look at Psalms 139 with me, we'll look at that and see how we can learn from that in this story. Thank you. We're going to look at verses 13 and 16 in Psalms 139. For you formed my inner parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance, and your book were written, every one of them. The days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. God has a plan for every day of your life. You are here for a purpose. If we continue in verses 17 and 18, now... How precious to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake, and I am still with you. The psalmist says, God, you think about me all the time. You planned all my days. You saw me even before I was born. In other words, you matter to God. You were born for a reason. Never forget that. Even if you were born in difficult circumstances, even if your family life wasn't what you had hoped it to be or you wished it would be, listen, you were born for a reason. God has a purpose for you. I heard a story of a museum guide who put this so elegantly. Um, he would take his tour groups into a darkened room, and then he would shine a light on a massive string and color that was apparently chaos. And he'd ask the group, what do you think this is? And they'd look at those strings, and they'd have no idea, and they would be like, ah, we have no idea. Why don't you tell us? And what he would do is he would direct them to the other side of the room, and then he'd shine a great big spotlight on this mass of chaos that was before. And what it was was it was a beautiful tapestry. And on that tapestry, the real work had to be seen from a different perspective to understand what the artist was doing. That's the way it works with God and his plan for you sometimes. We often look at our lives and we look at what's going on and we say, why or how? Why am I even here? And how can this possibly be working out for the good? Because there's no, there's a reason behind what God is doing. And we oftentimes overlook that. Because we are on the wrong side of eternity right now. So we don't exactly understand what God is doing in our lives. From God's perspective, he can see the order, and he can see the pattern, and the plan, and he can see the reason. God made you for a reason. You were born for a reason. But I want you to know 
something else tonight, something that is even more important. You may have been born for a reason. You were certainly born again for a reason. He not only made you, but he redeemed you through the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. Never let the devil tell you, never let the world tell you, never let yourself tell you that you don't have a purpose, that you don't have a reason. God made you for a reason, and you were born at the right time. So what have we learned so far? God has made you for a reason. But there is a second principle that I want you to see in this text from the birth of Moses. The Bible shows us that God works to accomplish his plan through you. I'm sorry, God works to accomplish his plan for you. God is working. Sometimes he works in a way that we can't see at all. But he is working to accomplish his plan for you. If we look back in our main text in chapter 2 of Exodus, we're going to go back there for a few seconds. And we're going to look at verse 4. And his sister stood at a distance to know what would be done with him. The Bible describes what happens to the little baby Moses. Now his mother makes a basket and covers it with a pitch and puts him in the river and he begins to float down the river. Let's think about this for a few moments. There's no rudder in that little basket. There's no sail. There's no direction. Little Moses couldn't reach out his hands and paddle like that. I mean, he couldn't make himself go anywhere. It was just floating right along. But the hand of God was guarding and guiding that little baby. Look at verses 5 and 6. Now the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her young woman walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her servant, and she took it. When she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby was crying. She took pity on him and said, This is one of the Hebrew children. Now the baby, Moses, he can't make anything happen. We've already really established that, right? And truthfully, his mother can't really make anything happen. Because the baby is under the death sentence of Pharaoh. But God is working. He's working every moment of the way. Think about what God is doing. He brought Pharaoh's daughter to the river at just the right time. If she comes two hours later or two hours earlier, she might not have seen the little floating basket. God caused that little ark to catch her attention. She might not have noticed it otherwise. And somehow, baby Moses cried just at the right moment. You know, Pharaoh's daughter may not have been so kindly disposed to the baby had he not cried. But the baby crying stirred compassion in her heart. God is doing all this all along. Notice what else the Lord did. He gave Miriam, Moses' sister, the wisdom to say to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child? He kept Moses in touch with his family and in touch with his heritage. But also notice what the Lord did. In his providence, he worked it out so that Pharaoh's daughter actually offered to pay Moses' mother to nurse the baby. That's even a greater blessing to that family. So think about all what happened. Can you see what God is doing in our story? Can you imagine the joy and the relief that Jochebed must have felt as she finds out not only is she getting her child back from the edge of the grave, but now she's got an official sanction and protection of Pharaoh's for her son. And she gets to take care of her precious son, and she gets paid to do it. You can't get any better than that, right? There's no coincidence here in all this. God's name, it may not be mentioned in these verses. If you look through verses 4 through 9, God's name isn't found one single time. But God's hand is all over these verses. His hands are all over what's happening. 
and His hands are all over our lives as His children, even when we may not immediately see what He is doing. I heard this story about a mother who came into her house after working out in the yard one afternoon, and she found her eight-year-old daughter in her room reading a book. Her mother said, Honey, what have you been doing while I was outside? The little girl said, Well, mainly I've just been sitting here reading my book. Her mother said, Are you sure you haven't done something else? The little girl was a little perplexed, and she said, Like what? And the mother said, well, here's what I think you did. You made yourself a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, and then you went into the piano room, and you practiced for a little while. Then you went into the TV room and watched television. And then you went into our bedroom and laid down on our bed. And then you came into your room and read your book. Is that what you have done? Well, the daughter, she thought maybe her mom was a CSI investigator or something. And she was like, well, yes, Mama, I did all those things. But how did you know? And the mom said, well, you got jelly on your fingers, and so there's jelly on the keys of the piano, there's jelly on the remote control in the TV room, and there's jelly on the bedroom door, and there's jelly all over the book that you're reading. Her fingerprints gave it away. If you look at your life, you'll see God's fingerprints all over your life. He providentially works out his plan and purpose for your life. Now, does that mean that we're just floating around aimlessly? No. Does that mean that we don't make plans? Of course not. No, we make plans. I want you to notice the baby was just floating, not just floating in the ark, but his mother had made some plans. She had made the ark, she had placed him in the river, and she had placed her daughter along to watch. She worked hard. She had a plan. She used her creativity. But she knew that God ultimately was responsible for making things happen. You make your plans, and you work your plans, but remember, God must work, or our plans will come to nothing. So do we plan? Yes. And do we act with wisdom? Yes. And do we work with all of our might? Of course we do. And do we make the most of all of our opportunities? Yes. But do we ultimately place ourselves and our plans and our families and our children and our ministry and everything else in the Father's hands? Absolutely yes. Because God is working to accomplish his plan for your life. Now there's a third principle we see in our passage tonight. God prepares you for your purpose. God is working in our lives, preparing us for what he wants us to accomplish through us. Notice with me in verse 10. When the child grew older, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses because she said, I drew him out of the water. Now, don't miss this. This is one of the most heartbreaking verses in all the Bible. But at the same time, it's one of the most encouraging verses in the Bible as well. There's heartbreak in this verse. It must have been really difficult for Moses' real mom and real dad, because think of, about this. In the eyes of Pharaoh's daughter, and in the eyes of Pharaoh's family, and in the eyes of all of Egypt, Jochebed was just the nurse. Amran was just the nurse's husband. We don't know all what Moses knew, but that's all Pharaoh's daughter knew. And so the time came when Moses' mother had to take the little baby boy, that little child, and deliver him to Pharaoh's daughter. He called Pharaoh's daughter mom, Jochebed and Amran watched as Moses became the son of another woman with a completely different set of virtues. He became one of them. He dressed like an Egyptian. He talked like an Egyptian. Heck, he probably even walked like an Egyptian. It must have been difficult, even heartbreaking, for them to watch. But listen to this. God was using even this. Now, it's very interesting, 
if you look in your Bibles, you discover that Acts chapter 7 is the twin passage in the New Testament to Exodus chapter 2. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there or go ahead and look on the screen and we're going to examine those verses real quick. Give me one second. Having technical difficulties. All right, we're going to look at verses 20 through 22 here. At this time, Moses was born, and he was beautiful in God's sight. And he was brought up for three months in his father's house. And he was exposed... Pharaoh's daughter adopted him and brought him up as her own. And Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. He was mighty in his words and deeds. Notice this, that Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. Now, in those days, the phrase wisdom of the Egyptians was a figure of speech. Someone who had a brilliant mind great knowledge, and a great education was said to have the wisdom of the Egyptians. Because in the days of Moses, the Egyptians had the greatest schools in all the world. The Temple of the Sun in Egypt is most likely where Moses would have been schooled and trained. This has been called the Oxford of the ancient world. Moses went there and he learned everything all of the wisdom that the Egyptians had to offer. One commentator that I was looking at a couple weeks ago summarized it like this. Moses began to learn the languages of the Egyptian at the temple. He also had plunged into the sciences, medicine, astronomy, and chemistry. Probably theology, philosophy, and even the law. He almost certainly took the Egyptian equivalent of the ROTC, studied the battles and the combat tactics and foes of the nation's proud military history. On top of that, he would have dabbled in the arts, sculpture, music, and painting. The whole world of Egyptian literature was open to him. The adopted son of the prince found himself immersed in Egyptian learning. It became his life. He learned all those things that the Egyptians had to offer. And listen to this, and this is the most important part. Everything Moses learned, God used. Think about what he became. He became the first historian of Israel. He wrote the history of the whole world from the time of creation all the way up to the children of Israel coming up to the promised land. He became a military tactician, and he led Israel to numerous battle victories. He became an administrator and led God's people. He was used by God to organize and lead the people of Israel. He also became a legal scholar. We talk about the first five books of the Old Testament, and in the New Testament, what do they call these books? Three-letter word? Law. All right. He wrote those legal books and the legal code for God's people. God used everything Moses experienced to prepare him for the work God had him to do. And God will do the same thing in your life. I've seen him do it in my own life. He has worked even when I didn't know it. He has worked to prepare me for what I have out in front of me. He's going to do the same for you. You don't know what God is up to sometimes. He can use your mistakes, your misfires, your regrets. The times when you feel like you're just wandering around and not accomplishing anything, he uses the desert of your life to turn it into an oasis. 
He will work to accomplish His plan in your life. And He works even when we don't see His hand at work. He is preparing you for a purpose. You were born for a reason. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for the opportunity that we had tonight to gather together and worship you, Lord, and to learn more about uh, your word, Lord. I thank you for the story of Moses, and I thank you for his birth, Lord, and for just for the wonderful man that he turned into. And I thank you for uh, the wonderful things you did in his life and the, that we can take away and learn and apply to our lives, Lord. I pray you be with us through the rest of this night, Lord, and that you just may protect us throughout the rest of this week. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.